happy to thank you all for coming today. We are very fortunate to have a very special lady with us. She has quite a story to tell. I've listened to her speak before and I will tell you, it's not an unemotional visit. So with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Margaret Hopkowitz, one of our absolute JCC treasures. Yes, absolutely. Can I see that really? Maybe I'll be on the bridge. She can sit down. No, I'd rather stand. I'd rather stand. Okay. Okay. Good. I want you to meet my granddaughters, Shana and Evie. Hi, Shana and Evie. Get some more seats for you. Yes. Good idea. Okay, ma'am. Well, I just want to let you know I'm Margaret Havkovic and I'm a Holocaust survivor of Swiss Birkenau and Bergen Belser. I was born in Czechoslovakia. It was just like Little America, that in 1938. After 1938 was changed, we were surrounded with Germans, soldiers, and other peoples. So everything changed after that. I come from a family, my parents, my brother, and my sister. My brother and my sister passed away already, and so does my parents. They announced it in the town where we live. It was a small town that every Jewish person should take some belonging with them and go to the school and wait. Well, of course, they didn't say how long we have to be away and whatever. Well, we did some belonging with us but they took my brother already to control the mind for the enemies, which were the Germans, of course. So if he would be killed, it would be okay, but not the ordinary uh, soldier. So my parents and my sister took some belongings and stay in the school for a while. <coughs> they announced that we will go to a bigger city where they accumulate all the Jewish people from around the town. Well, we were staying there for a while. We have very good neighbors, and they bring us some food there. So finally, We had to, I mean, the train came. Now, what kind of a train was it? It was not an ordinary train. It looked like a box, 
and you can sit only on the floor. Well, some people needed help to get up, and everybody sat on the floor. And we were surrounded with the Germans and their dogs. So finally, <coughs> the train started to go. They didn't tell us where we're going. But when the train was getting slowed down, then we find out that we came in Poland, Auschwitz-Birkenau, the extermination camp. So everybody has to be rushed out from the train. Everything has to be real fast, fast, fast. So we, <coughs> we didn't know we have to stay in the lane and be counted. My parents and my sister and me, um, we didn't know what was going on in the front of the transport, all those people standing there in the lane. Until we came to the front of the people, which were, I don't know how many soldiers. One was the doctor, his name was Dr. Mengele, which I will tell you all about her later. Well, when we came to the front of those people, they took out my mother and my father and sent them to the left side. It was very, very fast, everything. We didn't even say goodbye, nothing. My daughter, Dr. Aviva Dansky. Well, then when, then they look at us, those soldiers, my sister and me, they took us from the lane and sent us to the right side. And it was going on until everybody was selected. Well, we didn't know what's going to happen next. So the first thing what happened next, they shave us and give our different clothes and shoes to wear. I had a gray and blue striped dress which was lying on it, in it. Nothing else. So they took us to a shower and give us those dresses and took us to the place where we could rest. Well, we arrived in, the, in Auschwitz, Birkenau, it was already late, late in the evening. I could hardly recognize my sister with no hair on. Well, we tried to, the place where we were had to relax, it was a three-layer wooden bed, nothing on it. 
The time we arrived was it was in June 1944. So it was sort of bar. So and there was a lady to to us where we are and what we were supposed to do. We were in a camp where we are has to work. I have a tattoo in my arms, which is an A in front of it, which means in German Arbeit, working. 10,681 is my name. Well, in the early morning, in the wee hours, we had to get up and be counted. Not, like, not just like the block where we were, but the whole concentration camp, which was pretty big. So it took us staying in the line at least two to three hours and be counted. And that happened twice a day, one morning and all at night. So after that, I gave you a little coffee. And I want you to go and do some working. The place where we were staying, they didn't have a kitchen. So we had to carry the coffee from another cat. So that was our first job. And afternoon, they gave us a little soup, which didn't look like really a good soup, but we had to eat, drink it, if you wanted to leave. We were surrounded with an electric wire. If somebody touched it, drop dead right away. And many people do that. We work many places in Auschwitz. Now let me tell you that all those people who were on the left side, who went on the left side according to their telling, I mean, people telling you on the left or the right. The left side was for people to be exterminated. Guess them and put them in a crematorium. So that's my parents went. We laid it by this out. People who used to work in a crematorium they changed them pretty often, not to tell no one what's going on there, but they did. So, so what happened was, sister and me, I had to go and do some work. We had to do some cleaning and some uh, gardening. But it wasn't hard because most other people were doing different things and they were much heavier. Well, <clears throat> that was the day and at night we have that super that was it. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, we <coughs> especially do it to get us up and be counted in the middle of the night, just to make us more suffer. Well, how much you can suffer? I fainted in God always. And pray with my sister. My sister, 
and was happy that she was with me. But many people were by themselves and they just have to take it every day by day. <clears throat> Auschwitz was a, if you get a little bit sick, they put you to the place where you can get well, hopefully. If not, they case you and take you to the crematorium. I know many people who only read it died. Then go to the crematorium and get killed. Auschwitz, you know, the war was coming closer to Auschwitz-Birkenau. I mean the Russian army, because we were surrounded with the Russian and Americans to help us out. But they didn't come early enough. So they had to evacuate Auschwitz-Birkenau to go to another camp which was Bergen-Belsen, a smaller camp. They didn't have a crematorium, but people dying like flies. <clears throat> and it was a smaller camp than Auschwitz. And so you have to try it out this and see how it's going to be. There were many people already having typhus. Typhus is a illness where it's very contagious with a high fever. We all had a typhus. I had my sister has it. They not give you no medicine. They want you dead instead. So you just have to take whatever it comes. Many people have lies. So do I. Those people in Bergen Belgium, they were just dying like flies. They threw them out in front of the barracks because they didn't have no crematorium. Until there was a pile of humans, dead humans, in front of the barracks. It was raining on them and sunshine on them. <coughs> well, what can you do? Just wait and pray and see what's going to happen. The last thing they want us to do to take the clothes what the people already have it, be full of lies, and put it to a different place. The lies is just sucking your blood up. Well, I guess I, I could make it with God's help. <coughs> well, <ma> <coughs> they, we were surrounded very, very well with all the German soldiers. And at to the end, 
the main officers sort of disappeared. They were just ordinary soldiers. Just went away. I find out that the war was getting closer. And we were liberated. 1945, April 15, the British came in and told us that we are free. Well, so what you going to next? They send us to the place to recover for a half a, month, half a year. So we stayed in a town where we could eat normal food. And by the food what the German left there, it was poisoned. And many people who eat it died. So we went to a place where we could rest and waiting to go back home. Maybe my parents first home or my brother. No way. We came home and found a lady was living in our house. Then she moved out, and we didn't have no furniture, nothing. Everybody was, everything was gone. The neighbors still were there. They gave us some food to eat. So I find it somehow. We got better. The war was over, April 1945. So everybody wanted to go home or somewhere. So when they took us we the truck all over Europe because so many bridges was destroyed and trains didn't go. Then finally we got home. My brother came later. She was he was liberated by the Russian. And he was doing okay. He was working in a kitchen. So he had enough food. So my sister got married to her fiance, what was before, wanted to marry her. And she moved to that place, and she wanted me to go with her. So I go with her and stay there until I got a lady who told me there is a young man who would like to meet me. He was coming to America. I already packed my things go to Israel. Well, I change. <laughs> I came to America and married my husband. We lived 50 years in San Antonio. <laughs> 
and I met one of the soldiers <coughs> from the British people who came to visit me. I had a picture with him. He was, he was, he liberated Van der Welsen. He's, he told me he never see anything like that in his life. Well, that's why it happened. So we came to America and then we came to Dallas where my daughter lives. There is she. <laughs> So I came and I live here now because my daughter is with me and she's taking good care of me. Look after me and I appreciate it very much. Well, if you like to know some questions, if you have any question, I would like to answer for you. Margaret, uh, have you seen any of the people that you were in the camp with since you were liberated? No, those people I should stay appeal. We counted, they died. They were two sisters with us. They died to the end. When, when you went home, you didn't know if your parents were... Dead. I went home to Czechoslovakia. And over there, I went to live, stay with my sister. She lived in a different part. When did you find out your parents? Had you My parents never came back. I'm sure they were up. I mean, I see my father's eyes has tears. He knew there is no way to come out from there. Well. I'm doing this true story for those people who couldn't make it. Little kids with their mother. Mother went to the camp and guessed with their pair, with their mothers just because they were Jews. So it makes me feel better if I talk about those who never came back. How, Mar how old were you, Margaret? I was 21. When you went into the camp? 21. Do you have any question? Mickey does. Margaret, most of us that are here that remember those days, we were children then. We weren't old enough to know much of what was going on. We were children? We were children. Yeah, but how old you were? I was seven years old when the war started. Well, you were with your parents? <coughs> yes, I was, I was in Chicago. Chicago? Yes, and we, if we knew about it, we didn't know much about what was going on in Europe. Uh, the only way that I think that people found out about what happened, about people being taken away, was that families in Europe contacted their families in, in, in uh, America and, t and let them know. Because, for instance, 
you know Joe, my Joe. He was in the uh, he was in the Merchant Marine. He and he, he was over there in Europe. He said they didn't know no. what was going on. He was right there and didn't know what no, was no. going on. I mean, they kept this in a secret. Yes. That I, those people who were working in a crematorium, taking out them and burn them. So later they were killed too, because they didn't want them to spread, spread the news. But they did anyway. They kept it a, a secret, what was going on. Yes. All these concentration camps and all these... There are so many concentration know. camps. Yes, there's more than you think. There's how many? I mean, 42,000. Um, yeah. Thousands of concentration 42, camps. 42,000. And how yeah. the German people did not know this. Or, it's just beyond me. I just feel sorry for those little kids yeah. with their mother hanging on them. They don't know what to do with them. By the way, I forgot to tell you that a way to going to Bergen-Belsen, we have to march on the, on the highway in a big snow. I'm just having that one dress on, and I was okay. How many miles was that? How far? <laughs> it was a day and a half march. And you had no coat? No coat? No coat, just, just one like dress. Period. That dress oh, yeah. had a lining. And I tell you about the lining that helped me to get a raw potato. I was working in a kitchen. You know, when you work in a kitchen, you might have something to eat. So I had that dress with a lining, and I opened up the side and put two potatoes down in the head. Of course, they, they test you, test you, when you go out from the kitchen. But they didn't test me on the hem of the dress. <laughs> that apple tasted to me the that potatoes taste to me like an apple. <laughs> I mean, I was a Muslim man, skin and bone. But I don't know, I was just type of a skinny girl. My, daughter, my sister always was heavier. But I, I felt okay, I mean, never got sick, only when the typhus. Um, I thank the God for all that, but he saved me and my sister. So whatever happened to you, you just have to be busy, keep on working, and think something else beside where you were in a bad place. If it's a good place, you enjoy it. Margaret, what would you think about? What did I do about? What did you think about? What I think about? What I think about to be free get married and have children. And of course, if I have my sister still living with me, you know, to have a family, decide not to have a parent. How did your brother make it through? My brother, <coughs> he was working for the, looking for a mind exploded on the field. They took him before us. They were looking for the mine because they, if they would die, if they would die, it's okay. 
but not this other people. I'm the child of Holocaust survivors, and what you said about having a sibling or a friend with you is what saved most people's lives. My mother was a child in, in the camp. She was nine when she was in the ghetto, and she had an aunt that she survived with who was an adult about your age, had a child, didn't survive, and this aunt was such a go-getter and knew how to get stuff and trade stuff, and because of that, my mother, who when they finally got to Robinsburg, because they took him out of Auschwitz, was able to survive. She was very sick at the end, but this aunt somehow got her through it. And uh, it was, it's what you so said, when they were by themselves, they had so little chance, because they had no one to love them, no one to feel humanity. There was nothing. All you had was brutality, and that, that relationship was so critical to survival. It really was, what you said was so true. And thank you for telling me today. Well, you just, what can you do if you are there? You just have to yeah. take day by day, one by hour. Mm -hmm. you, you go to sleep and you wake up. And here you are again, the same thing. So, <clears throat> all those places, I mean, in Bergen, Bergen wasn't no bad at all because there were so many people there. So they're just, just sitting and on the floor and like sleeping. Uh, they would be. I, I notice you have a ribbon and a medal. What are you wearing around your neck? I got this with my friend from from England, from London. I mean, they were here, to, came to visit me, that guy. And we were honored as the Second World War survivors. And that is from the Daughters of America, of the Second World War. <coughs> That was a real nice surprise. Margaret, can you talk about when the American soldiers came? When you first realized... I didn't see the American soldiers. Oh, the British. They were not around. Only the British and the Russian. So can you talk about when you first realized you were free? Yes. Well, everybody was free that time. The war was over. Remember you were lying in your barracks? What is it? You were lying in your barracks. Everyone was like half dead. And you yeah, looked out the I window. Mean, they were in a concentration camp. <laughs> and they were gassed. But now they didn't suffer too much when they were gassed. The others who just come in the camp they see what they are up to. No, that, that day that the British came in, what were you doing? Where were you when the British came? Well, when the British came in, I was in Bergen, Belgium. And I mean, they, they told us that we are free. And we couldn't believe it that we are free. You were sick. I had a high fever and have typhus. So they take me to a place to recover. How did you get across Europe and to America? I came to a truck. In many places, the bridge was destroyed. So we tried to sit on the train in Hungary, Budapest, Hungary that take us to Czechoslovakia. And it was a pretty bad time to, find, to come home, I mean, to find a way to come home with nothing. I mean, of course, they didn't want money. They didn't want you to pay me. They don't have nothing from the camp. Who provided the trains? 
Who provided it? The very trucks. people who provide it. I mean, you had no money. <laughs> and if you have us a little note that you were coming from the concentration camp, you don't have to pay nothing. Well, we didn't have no money. They took us everything. Yes. I just wondered how how you managed who paid for your traveling and it was free because she was in the concentration. Well, it was the government. A note. It was the Allies. The Allied yeah, like government. Took I came to America. I was a little kid. I didn't know how this was. Came to America was paid by my husband uncle. Okay. He passed away long time. But you were married when you came before you came here. <coughs> yeah, I mean we left, we married before he died. In where he was you? living in New Braunfels, and he provided transportation for us. Yeah. But at yeah. that time, but he was dead already, but he edited. That's why he came to Texas. Mm -hmm. She met she met my father and a few months later they came to America. <coughs> Where did they meet? Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia. You know, Czechoslovakia was a beautiful country with everything, like America, little America, people love there. Marlene, have you, gone back, have you gone back to Czechoslovakia since you've been here? Have you returned to Czechoslovakia to visit? I and I left. Okay. I don't have nothing there anymore. No one. I just didn't know if you had gone back after you lived here a while just to for the country. When you come back, you know, you think about right. when you had your life, mm -hmm. good, everything. Well, what can you do? It happened and it can be fixed. Margaret, were you from a, a rural family? Did you kind of live in the country or did you live in the cities? Or it didn't bother me. I was working in a city. What did your father do in Czechoslovakia? What kind of My father was taking care of a great big farm, which was whatever was growing there, they sent them to the different country. They export corn, potatoes. They didn't keep it. They sent it to a different country. And, you and milk, them. milk too, with a stainless steel cans. Put the milk and send it to another city. So you grew up on the farm? I grew up on the farm and I had a very good time growing up. I was playing in a wheat. You know, they bring in the wheat from the field, already was taken off the, the straw, just plain wheat. And I had a very good time. I have everything. We have very good food, the best. And everybody was happy. My brother was loved to ride the horses, and I was driving a two little one horse uh, carriage with one horse on it. And all the dogs in the neighborhood came running. <laughs> you know, in this country, there were very few Jewish farmers. <laughs> that was not something that most Jewish people were in some kind of business situation. In Europe, I guess there were a lot of Jewish farmers. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they, I mean, they're making money from the farmers. Yes. But they were people who worked for them. Mm -hmm. 
they have to work in a farm to grow things. Yes. And after it's grew, you have to still put it away and send it away. I mean, for another country. Well, that was, I mean, you learn many things living in a farm. You know about how the chicken comes out from the, from the tail. eggs, a little ducks, little, all the little things, animals, I mean, turkey, they have to be very delicate, carefully with the turkeys, they are very delicate. So my mother put their legs in a place where they get strength. I grew up in the country too. And there are things you learn in the country that you never <laughs> learn in the city. <laughs> By some things you don't want to talk about. <laughs> if you haven't tasted a liver from the goose, a stuffed liver goose from liver, liver, my grandmother used to the stuff. most delicious <coughs> food in the world. I knew a couple here who ordered from Europe a liver to send her to San Antonio. <laughs> Did you move to San Antonio it's, it's because there are no Jews in New Braunfels? What is that? Did you move to San Antonio because there were no Jews in New Braunfels? New Braunfels has no Jews San except Antonio the Schmitz. San Antonio has lots of Jews. There are lots of Jewish people in San Antonio. In San Antonio, but yeah. not in New Braunfels, not even they in have synagogue. have a kosher kitchen. Huh? They have a kosher kitchen and a kosher place for the older people to eat kosher, but not in Dallas. Not Dallas in, doesn't have. Not in New Braunfels either, yeah. I mean, they come from Europe, yeah. from, uh, from New York people, religious people with a beard. <coughs> right. And they are very strict religious. Right. <coughs> Well, I just want to thank you all for coming. Thank you.